Okay, and there he is. Okay. Intervening variables. Intervening variables. Now, Paul says that these are constructs. That is, they are not observable. It's not something which you can see, but it's something which has to be there. And you can tie these intervening variables up with <coughs> things that you can observe. You can't see them. Okay. What he actually said was that these intervening variables are symbolic constructs. In other words, it's not something that you can see or that you can measure. It's unobservable, but you know they exist. what you actually see and can measure. Okay. Uh, okay, you'll have to go back a little ways. Okay, we know now that you have, we have actually seen protons and electrons. But originally, as a theory, these things were intervening variables. They were a name tacked on something which couldn't be seen, but which everybody knew who was working with them existed. Okay. The same thing with intervening variables. We know they're there, but they're unobservable, at least right now. It's a construct. Yeah, way back. Yeah. But, okay, but you know it's there, but how do you know it's there? Because you can feel it. Okay, that's what I mean by observable. Okay, any way that it hinges on your sensory system, then you can observe it. Okay, if you were not able to move when there was no wind, uh, back way up, like 2,000 years, okay, when people, right before people first discovered there was such a thing as air, okay, then they knew something was there, but it was unobservable. They didn't realize what they were observing. So that's an intervening area of the wind. It's something which you can't observe, but which you know exists. It has to. Yeah, that's a good one. That's a, that's a good one, yeah. Okay, and there's two primary intervening variables which Hull describes. Now, remember we were talking about <coughs> actions and there's this little psychological thing and then you go ahead and do the action. What Paul says is that intervening variables have a relationship both to that psychological antecedent and to the action. They come between those two and they bridge the gap between the two. react on both, they're between both, okay? and they go between the antecedent condition and the subsequent action. Okay. Well, I can't really draw on the board, okay? I'm two more, okay? So, I'm going to take my sweater off. The antecedent condition, the psychological one or the physiological one is that I'm doing more. The action is that I'm going to take each individual button and then remove my sweater, right? Okay. Hull says there are intervening variables between the time that I decide that I'm too warm and the time that I start unbuttoning that first button. Okay. Now these intervening variables have a relationship between the fact that I'm too warm and the fact that I will then start unbuttoning. 
Now let me give you the two intervening variables which we're going to be talking about, and you'll see it crystal clear, okay? <coughs> Those are the two intervening variables which Hall talks about, habit and drive. And there's a little code, and I'm going to give these to you. It's not necessary that you really remember them, but we're going to be using them, so they'll probably come to you naturally. Okay, habit is symbolically like that. Okay, S H R, and drive is just D. Here's a shorthand. It's sort of like instead of saying sodium, you put down Na, or potassium, you put down K. Okay, instead of putting down habit, you put SHR. Instead of drive, you put D. Now let's talk about habit. There's some little things that Paul says about habit which will help you understand what he means by it. Okay. This habit takes into account the organism's learning ability. into account the learning of the organism. Okay, and when we're talking about learning, what Hull really means is that the learning of habits, okay, that is this portion right here, strengthens the tie between the stimulus, that is being too warm, and the response, beginning to unbutton the sweater. And that little S is really to be thought of as the stimulus, and the R is the response. So the habit ties these two things together really strongly. <coughs> yeah. Habit is something that the organism learns which strengthens the relationship between the stimulus and the response. And when you talk about habits, okay, you think of like bad habits, and you're sort of close to what Paul is talking about, okay, but not quite. Just because you have a habit doesn't mean that you're going to do it. There's something else that's necessary. For instance, a person may bite his fingernails. That's a habit. But he isn't always doing it. There must be something else involved before he takes up that activity. And that thing is dry. So could you say the drive is the system? No, what the drive does, it energizes the habit. Okay, the drive is the engine, the motor that propels habits along. <coughs> what Hall is actually saying is you can think of habits as automobiles transporting activities and drive is the power system for this little automobile which is carrying along all these activities now I think you will see it very clear when I make a, one more statement what Hull also says is that these two have a relationship on each other much stronger than what I just said. What Hull says is that this habit is multiplied by drive and gives you the strength of the activity. <coughs> 
again. Let's take Habit first, okay, and Drive, and try to get some idea as to how these two can multiply or magnify each other and produce a more intense activity. Okay, Paul says that a habit grows in strength in proportion to the number of trials. When you're first learning to drive a car, you know you want to stop the car, but it's kind of awkward that first time to push on the brake. But as the number of trials, that is the number of times that you push on the brake, increases, okay, the more that habit <coughs> of pushing on the brake pedal becomes stronger, and the more easily it's accomplished. So that if you're a passenger in a car, and all of a sudden, another car pulls in front of you. You know how you stomp on the floor? That's because even though there was no pedal there, this habit of stopping the car by pushing on the brake pedal is still there. Okay? That's the habit part. So Hall says, the more times you perform this, the more of a habit it becomes, and the stronger this <coughs> SHR is in that little formula over there. Now there's a lot of other variables which come into play, like rewards, reinforcements, uh, the time interval between when you pound on the brake or whatever, okay? But let's not even get involved in that. Uh, the more often that you perform this, the more strong it becomes. Okay. Now what about drive? What drive, <coughs> drive just sort of exists. That's the best way I can explain it. It just sort of exists. And what drive is, is the organism's relationship to its deprivation, okay? That is, if you're deprived of food, your drive to get food increases or the drive may increase under intense stimulation. Okay, so either deprivation or intense stimulation can strengthen drive. Now, let's go back and look at this. You have an activity pounding on the brake pedal with your foot. If it's the first time in your car and you have the drive of the emergency, okay, now this is not really what I just explained in drive, but you have this emergency, right? But the habit isn't very well developed. The activity itself may be pretty strong, but uncoordinated. If your habit is very strong, <coughs> and the drive, that is the emergency, is very strong, the activity will be very intense. Okay. Now that doesn't mean that you're going to lock all four wheels. Okay, There's a little bit of coordination involved here too. Okay. But you can see that the activity will increase. Now, knowing what you do now, let's give an example of an activity and figure out what habits and drives are. Give me an activity. When you're in the car with a child or a baby and it's taking a break from the baby, put your hand out to hold the baby back. What was talking about? Yeah. Okay, that's I don't know whether nobody's in the car or not. I don't make my hand out all the time. Okay. Hold the baby back. So, let's see. I'm talking I'm trying to figure out a better way of getting a cross drive to you. Okay, eating. That's a good one. <laughs> okay, you know, okay, eating's a good one because I can find it in later on. Okay, okay. eating. You know from habit that when you eat, that you're going to get satiated. 
the drive, the hungrier, hungrier you are, the more intense that drive towards that goal object, food, is. In other words, the instrumental activities increase as drive increases. And the instrumental activities also increase, although in eating it's not very clear, as the habit increases. Is it eating a habit? Eating is a habit, yeah. You know from past experience, okay, that there's a stimulus and there's a response. In other words, you're hungry, the response is that you eat. The stimulus disappears and you stop responding. Okay, so it's a habit, definitely. Okay, and it's a drive because you have a physiological as well as a psychological need to eat. Okay, so they multiply each other. The hungrier you get, the greater the activity. Okay, now. Can't you overcome that drive or intensify that drive yourself? Oh, certainly. Yeah. Isn't this what we're having now with the with the only the athletes who are becoming faster and faster when it was not impossible because they're learning more about controlling the drives. So okay, well there's three things that come into account. Okay, One is the way that athletes are forming their habits is always <coughs> undergoing change. They're finding the most efficient ways of learning these habits. Okay, the techniques of running against certain other people. <coughs> In addition, okay, the drive is there because there's always a need to excel over someone else, okay? Or you'll notice uh, horse race, uh, horses, okay, have a tremendous urge to run, that is their activity, if they are deprived of running the day before the race, okay? This activity, running, is ingrained by habit and the drive is sky high because it's a habit which they have to do. Okay. In addition, there's physiological reasons why athletes are better. Okay. And these two do play a role. Right. Okay, now there's something we didn't mention. Okay, and I'm gonna mention it in passing. Okay, there's a little thing called secondary reinforcers. S little R. Okay, we're going to come back to it. I'm going to make a little marginal note that there's secondary reinforcers. Okay, that is that there are conscious underlying reasons for performing certain activities which are not really primary goals. <coughs> we talked about consumatory activities as being the end. Okay. Well, actually, when you do something, there's probably a whole bunch of different reasons for doing it. Most of them are secondary reinforcers. Okay. We'll talk about that when you come back to break. <laughs> Activities. Okay, in other words, let me give you an example. Okay, when you're young, right, you're a baby, right? Every time you eat, you see your mother, right? You see your mother every time you eat when you're a baby, or you see somebody, okay? Therefore, as you get older, eating with other people, okay? That eating with other people, other people is a secondary reinforcer, okay? You eat socially, not just because you're hungry, but because of the secondary reinforcement of sociability or being able to see somebody else as you're eating. <coughs> okay, there's some other stuff, though, before we go into secondary reinforcers, which will help really a lot, I think, in explaining the secondary reinforcers. The resulting activity was in 1943, It's interesting to know what's happened since then. Some of you who are very observant you may have realized that this habit and this drive does not account for all the intensity or lack of it in activities. 
And the reason is something I mentioned in passing that I said I didn't want to get involved in, and that's the number of rewards or the space between rewards. Research has determined that this really has very little effect on the strength of activities. What really has a more intense effect on activities is another intervening variable. K. And K, for some reason, stands for incentive motivation. Now let's see if I can explain this a little bit. Okay. Paul's theory is changed then to say that habits are affected by, that is multiplied effectively, by drive and incentive motivation. Now let's describe incentive motivation a little bit. Okay, it's still equal to this activity. So you're adding D and K together and multiplying it times habit. <coughs> John, um, how would you relate that to like the story in the book about uh, you know, uh, this thing? Yes. Uh, Nicole. Yeah. Nicole. 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 Meatball's case, this is really pretty high, the way things worked out. He had three real incentives. Okay? His drive was really to eat, originally. And so as the drive to eat decreased and the incentive increased, okay, his habit actually changed. First, his habit decreased almost immediately. Okay? And his habit of not eating, his changing of habits to new situations where he didn't have to eat, okay? uh, became more important to him. And for him, the K was much more important than the drive was. The K, you mean the three people? The incentive. The incentive. See, he had incentive from three different areas, if I remember the story correctly. First of all, he was getting money. Okay. Plus he had people who were, you know, really on his side and helping him. Plus there was the incentive once he initially started to lose weight of actually seeing the results. So this K became very high. Availability, 
frequency, <laughs> incentive, and motive. Okay, question was asked during the break about the relationship of the environment to a, the organism. We've already said that the only thing that <coughs> between an organism and its environment is its behavior. Thus, behavior or activities has an effect on the environment as well as on the individual. Okay, the individual can change his environment by behavior. Okay, so the environment shapes an organism's behavior, but also how the organism uh, senses its environment actually changes as the organism behaves differently. For instance, I was hot, I took my sweater off, okay? It made me cooler. The way I sense the environment, which was too warm, is now just right. Okay, so there's a working relationship between the environment and the organism. There, primarily, these things can be divided up into two uh, types of determinants <coughs> of behavior. and situational. You come in to a situation. You're too warm. There's two things which affect you. That is the situation. You're too warm. And what you did the last time you were too warm. The historical aspect of it. Availability motive are historical types of determinants. Okay. And expectancy and incentive are really situational. Explain this, I think you'll see it pretty clearly. Action itself is a pretty old one. As a matter of fact, it started in the 18th century. How many people have taken philosophy? Okay, well, there were two European philosophers who kind of worked on this problem. <coughs> Not in psychological terms, but in philosophical terms. Uh, Locke was one, and Bentham was another. Okay. And those two guys uh, and other philosophers said that an individual has a set of choices. At any moment in time, the person has a set of choices. And that of these choices, man picks one. Okay. Locke and Bentham both, both say that at any given time you have a whole bunch of choices that you can make. And you make one. You make one choice. Okay. In other words, you have one tendency <coughs> and you pick the strongest <coughs> and you go towards that tendency and you start behaving in a certain way. Now, they say that the choice you make will maximize pleasure and reduce to a minimum pain or unhappiness. Okay, now somebody brought this up uh, Tuesday. Well, don't you always do the thing that's easiest, that gives you the most reward? Okay, well, this is sort of an old theory, okay? Uh, you were right as far as you went, but you're talking about the 1700s, how people thought. 
In other words, there's an individual liberty, an individual liberty, and you do the thing which is really what you think is the best or the most pleasurable for you at the time. So like you make mistakes, but it's all for pleasure okay, and reduction of pain. Between the 18th and the 20th century, there was really nothing much going on except that people were trying to figure out ways of measuring and uh, how much stress should be placed on this maximizing of gain and minimizing of loss. And that's all they were talking about, was how to measure it and how much stress should be placed on it. And back up just a second now, Bentham, okay, in 1789, had a little paper put out called Hedonic Calculus. from hedonism, right, working for yourself, and calculus, that is, calculations. And Bentham's argument was that men are sort of calculating machines that go around and calculate how much pleasure or how much pain they derive from doing certain things, and they come up with what to them is the most beneficial action to take. saying sometimes the strongest tendency is not the one that you go towards. Okay, so Freud is really saying this principle of action is not really always true. In fact, usually it's not true. Okay? It's not always necessary that a man consciously thinks that something is the best for him. Okay? Sometimes his actions are ruled by unconscious motives motives which he doesn't really have any awareness of. Is he right or is he the other way? Right? Well, he's sort of right. Okay, we're getting closer as we come forward. But wouldn't that still lead toward that that principle of action though? Because you can't you can't consciously know which one you're going toward. But then okay. it'll be the strongest tendency. <coughs> sort of. The principle of action was that 
Okay, the orbit strong is known a, tendency. Right. Yeah. In those terms. Yeah. strong tendency to do it. In other words, the principle of action is still there, but it's an unknowing, it's unconscious, it's below your level of awareness. Okay. Sort of. Okay. Involuntary means that you have no control over it. Okay. But Freud proved that you do have control over it. Once you know, in other words, once these unconscious activities become known to you, and you are aware of them, then you can change your ultimate behavior. Okay? So they are involuntary until you know how to control them. Then they become somewhat voluntary. Okay. In other words, you consider your heart to be an involuntary muscle. In other words, it just goes automatically. Okay. Yet for some people who have learned to control their heartbeat, the heart muscle is no longer an involuntary muscle. It is at times a voluntary muscle that they can slow down activity or speed up activity. So for most people, the heart remains an involuntary muscle. But for some people, it's almost a voluntary muscle. It's the same thing with our motives. Some of them are unconscious, but when we are made aware of them, then we know how to deal with them and we change our behavior. Okay? Don't get too confused on it. Okay? Because we're going to talk about Freud and you'll see how all this unconscious and conscious awareness comes up. And what Freud is talking about is uh, like dreams or people say like a Freudian slip where you're saying a sentence and you make an error, which is really what you want to say, what you say by accident. Uh, and neurotic symptoms, that is mental illnesses, are sometimes based in an unconscious area. Okay. Let me give you some little background in Freud. Freud had patients coming to him who at that time were not medical cases. Okay? They were, there was nothing medically or physically wrong with them. Okay? Sometimes they had no feeling in a hand. Okay? It was an hysterical symptom. There was an unconscious reason for them to have no sensations in their hand. The reason was unconscious. Freud says, once you bring up the reason for this hysteria to a conscious level and the person understands, the hand will react normally again. The hysteria will disappear. What Freud says about motives is that most of our motives are unconscious. That is, they are not a level of awareness. It's not something we can control. But once somebody helps us to discover these unconscious motives and can give us some idea as to how to cope with them, then we can change them and we ultimately change our behavior. Does that make a little bit better parallel? Yeah, later on in the 20th century, 1943, I think it was, there's a man named Hull, and you'll be hearing a lot about Hull because he's probably one of the pioneers in motivation research. And Hull has a new principle by which motives work, 
and the best thing to do is just let me run through it once and then go back over it really slow. What Hall says is that there are little things called momentary excitatory potentials. Excitatory potentials are really weird because you actually perform an activity which is related to the strongest of them. Okay? So it's pretty close to a principle of action, but it's much more transient and much smaller. Okay? Excitatory potentials, the strongest of which is performed. Now, the main thing to remember is that Hull did not say anything about pleasure or pain as a means of defining these things. He says they exist. There is no pleasure or pain involved in measuring them. In other words, if you have two of these, one being pleasurable and one being painful, and they are both of the same strength, you cannot assume that the person will always go towards the pleasurable one because you can't measure these on the basis of pleasure or pain. Okay? 